tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, no, ko huhu mai nei te nei pō. Um, no mai, haere mai and welcome uh, to our panel event uh, recognising and responding to coercive control and systemic entrapment. Um, I am Charlotte Moore, I'm the kaiwhakahaere for the New Zealand Family Violence Clearing House and we're hosting this event this evening. I'm going to make some very brief housekeeping remarks before I hand it over to people who are far more interesting than I am. Um, but before we do that, um, we'd just like to open our hui tonight uh, with a karakia, um, just to create a space for us all to be in this evening. Me karakia tato. Fakatakati hau ki te uru, fakatakati hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā taratara ki tai. E hi aki ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, te hei mauri ora. So welcome everyone, it's delight to have you all here with us this evening. Um, also want to acknowledge that we're meeting tonight um, on um, the lands of Ngāti Whātua Orake um, and acknowledge their um, position as mana whenua. Um, want to acknowledge all of our wonderful panel um, participants this evening um, who we're going to be hearing from shortly. Just some so without further ado, I think I've ticked off all of my list of um, of tasks. I'm going to hand you over to Professor Nicola Gavey, who is the Academic Director of for the New Zealand Family Violence Clearing House. Kia ora. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, we're extremely pleased to be hosting this event this evening. Um, thank you all so much for coming. It's quite a novelty um, to all be able to meet in person after you know, a number of years when we haven't been able to do that. Coercive control is an issue that's been on our radar at the Clearing House for quite a while now. We know that in the audience today there are people with lots of knowledge and various kinds of expertise um, related to coercive control and as well as people for who the concept is um, much newer. Sorry, coercive control is the harmful dynamic that shapes most domestic and family violence, including its most dangerous forms. But some of the elements of coercive control can be subtle and not necessarily obvious to those outside of the relationship. Overall, it seems that it is still not widely understood beyond specialist sectors. In this evening's event, we are very fortunate to have three of New Zealand's leading researchers in this area, Rachel Smith and Denise Wilson, and Julia Tolmey, who will be joining us for the Q&A panel. And we're also delighted to welcome Professor Heather Douglas uh, from the University of Melbourne Law School, who is one of Australia's leading academics in this area. All of our speakers tonight bridge the worlds of academia and research alongside contributing to policy and other initiatives with government and communities as well as contributing to professional education. They are all experts on coercive control and the broader concept of social entrapment, which draws our attention to the role of systemic factors beyond the immediate interpersonal context in contributing to the harm of intimate partner violence. This includes the role of deep structural factors, colonisation, and structural inequalities of gender, class, ethnicity, sexuality, disability, and so on. The concept of social entrapment also draws attention to the critical role of social and institutional responses in affecting the outcome for victim survivors of domestic and family violence. Without more widespread societal recognition of the complex nature of coercive control and the serious um, sorry, the signs of serious violence and harm will continue to be misinterpreted, minimised and missed altogether. Social and institutional responses that are indifferent and unhelpful and in some cases hostile and obstructive can further silence and isolate women and others affected by coercive control and help keep them trapped in relationships that are harmful and potentially highly dangerous. Our speakers will share research and insights that we hope will support your ongoing work, uh, as well as spark wider conversations towards raising awareness about the dynamics of coercive control and the structural factors that enable it and hide it, so we can collectively build well-informed, wider responses to victims and survivors, as well as helping to undo the structural and systemic factors that enable it in the first place. 
Um, my colleague Elizabeth MacDonald sitting here, um, who is an independent researcher and adjunct professor of law at the University of Canterbury, and I will be sharing um, the chairing this evening. Um, before I introduce our first speaker, Rachel Smith, um, I just want to note that we are looking forward to a Q&A at the end of the presentations, um, but also just to note that Elizabeth and Heather have to rush out at 10 to 7 to catch a taxi to the airport. Um, so please excuse in advance if we need to bring things to a close a little bit more crisply than we would pr probably all prefer to. Um, it's now my um, pleasure to introduce Rachel Smith, um, who is a lecturer at Auckland University of Technology Violence and Trauma Studies Programme. Rachel has worked in the family violence sector for over 20 years in the UK and Aotearoa, with roles spanning strategic positions within government and frontline management roles in non-government organisations. Um, and Rachel previously led the review of family violence deaths um, for the New Zealand Family Violence Death Review Committee. Welcome, Rachel. Oh, kia ora koutou. I hope everyone can hear me at the back. Please wave if I start to go quiet. It's lovely to look out and see lots of familiar faces. So kia ora and thank you everyone for coming on a Monday at 5.30. I need to stick to time, so I will be glancing at my phone to make sure that I stay on track. So my role here is really to introduce the concept of coercive control, and this has been a really highly influential concept internationally. It's influenced government policy, it's influenced legislation, as we'll hear from Heather, in the UK and Australia. And it's also dominated a lot of the academic debates and literature, which I think is problematic. But first of all, when we think about the shift that coercive control has made, it is huge because a lot of our theories around intimate partner violence have tended to problematise victim survivors, focused on their deficit behaviours or thinking. We think about battered woman syndrome, it's all about pathologising victim survivors' responses to violence. And so this is a real shift from learned helplessness, which is actually based on the work about abused dogs. So we needed these shifts. And so for anyone who doesn't know the histories of some of these models, um, this is something to go back and look at. And so coercive control has taken us from that pathologizing lens to really not looking at the victim survivor, but actually looking at the coercive and controlling tactics of the person using violence. And even Stark, he really started this work in about 1995 when he started writing his book. And he wrote this book around coercive control and how it entraps women because he saw that in the US the domestic violence movement had stalled. Because a lot of the frameworks, and you'll notice the power and control wheel, the power and control wheel, what's around the outside is physical and sexual violence. And so a lot of what had happened over in the US is they had developed systems, particularly around criminal justice systems, that focused on physical violence and sexualized violence, on incidents of violence, and developed programs and interventions. So he really saw that this focus on the physical violence really misunderstood the biggest crime of coercive control, which is their liberty crimes. So coercive control is not about physical acts of violence, it's about crimes against people's ability to be self-determining. And so this is a much wider framework. And so rather drawing upon um, psychology and psychiatry, and I'll say Western psychology and psychiatry, he's drawing upon human rights frameworks. And so he's talking about you know, rights to liberty, rights to equality, rights to citizenship. And so that's where this thinking around coercive control has come from. And so it is transformational to think about it as a crime against self-determination. And I think if we consider any forms of violence from a collective perspective, we're in Aotearoa, and we look at colonial violence, that's a collective um, crime against people's ability to be self-determining. And so this is a really important concept. And also he was talking that this is pattern-based, so you cannot look at individual acts of violence to try and understand the whole story. And so the tactics of coercion and control, they operate together and reflect on each other. 
And so you have to think about them as architecture of abuse. And so it's not about saying this is violence, this is emotional abuse, and categorising like a lot of the other frameworks have done when you look at the power and control wheel or Johnson's typology. This is understanding that drip, drip, drip of abuse that happens in every single day life and the combined cumulative impact as it shrinks people's ability to be themselves. So it takes their world and what matters and shrinks that space for action. So very importantly, he didn't see any deficit base for women experiencing violence. They were prevented from their life projects because of the coercive control, not because they had any deficiencies, which a lot of those other Western theories were focused upon. And importantly, he said that this is particularly targeted at the person who's experiencing violence by someone who knows them intimately. And so it's going to look different in different contexts, and it might look very, very subtle. The other key factor to understand around coercive control is, as a saying, it's not about categorising different forms of violence. And if you sort of look further into it, these have been some of the issues that have happened in Australia and other countries. People have tried to say coercive control is the same as psychological abuse. And so I think that's really dangerous territory to get into. He's actually saying it's the cumulative violations and transgressions of personhood that we need to be understanding. And it's those multiple transgressions that are entrapping people in this abuse. So that all sounds really important, and it is transformative, and it's the same, particularly framing it within that human rights framework. The problem that we have is if you look at all those models that I put up, they're really focused on individuals. They're focused on person using violence, men using violence against women. And when we use these models that just focus on individuals, we limit the forms of violence that we can actually make visible. And so really coercive control, what we're looking at is men's violence towards women. And so coercive control does focus on gender inequity, but it doesn't focus on the other forms of structural violence and oppression that are happening in people's lives. And so one of the warnings that I wanted to point to is what's actually been happening over in Australia. And here is some, there's a great article there at the bottom, um, Castral Feminism and Coercive Control When Indigenous Women Aren't Seen as Ideal Victims or Witnesses or Women. And these are some of the tweets in that article. And so when we have models that focus on individual narratives of violence, then we're actually not looking at all the other forms of violence, state violence, colonial violence, structural violence. And we know these are really, really important when we're looking at intimate partner violence. And so coercive control, even though it's a shift, it's still based on centering whiteness. And so when we think about it, it's really centering, still centering white middle class women's lives. And so sometimes how this gets corrected and people will be aware of the concept of intersectionality. If people haven't, that was developed way back in the 1980s and 90s by Kimberly Crenshaw and really what she was talking to the fact of how um, black women and the white women's domestic violence movement were invisibilized and marginalized and black women in the civil rights movement um, were also marginalized. And so she was saying that we need to look at those intersecting forms of violence, so racism, classism, sexism, to make visible black women's lives. Now that's been sort of taken, this idea of these you know, structural axes of oppression, and what's happened in a lot of the work is that white-centered feminism has then used intersectionality to reframe it as about looking at diverse identities or used in an othering manner. And so this is, I think, also quite problematic when we take these frameworks like coercive control that really centre white lives and think we'll just clip on uh, maybe a bit of intersectionality um, to make visible other people's experiences. And so when we're, we're all living in Aotearoa, we're living in a settler state, and so we actually need to make colonial violence visible. And so if we think about intersectionality, how that might operate here, then colonial violence is the scaffolding and the architecture that those other axes of oppression operate within. And so I would suggest, and it's not just myself, I draw upon all the wonderful um, work of decolonising feminisms, is we actually need to use frameworks 
that are decolonising, not just looking at intersectional intersectionality. And we also need to use frameworks for understanding intimate partner violence that make the family violence response system visible. And this is a lot of the work that Denise will talk to when we're talking about systemic entrapment. And so if we're only really looking at that individual narrative of violence around coercive control, um, then we're not also understanding how our current institutions, and if you think about some of the really key reports that have come out of the Waitangi Tribunal, um, you know, we're thinking about the primary healthcare systems institutionally racist, then these are really significant when we think about where people might be seeking help and what type of help they might be getting. And the other issue I wanted to raise is really thinking about is criminalisation the way that we want to go? And we often know that even though coercive control, we might not criminalise it here in Aotearoa, once you take a concept like that, then it's often what's used across the whole sector to make sense of people's experience of intimate partner violence. And if we look at what's happening with the Royal Commission, we have learned a lot that actually criminalisation, who gets criminalised in this country, is not equitable. And so there's also a lot of um, concerns that have been raised in Australia around the over-criminalisation of Indigenous women and the under-protection from the state. Thank you. So we need to be really, really careful when we're thinking about what frameworks we're going to be using to guide the sector responses, because once you criminalise something, it's going to have a wider implications across the sector. So those are just some words of warning. So the work that I've been involved with, with Denise and Julia, and actually this concept of systemic entrapment really just builds upon when we think about all critical race theory, um, indigenous feminism, so this is not a new concept, but what we need to be doing is really making visible that wider social context. And so if we look at coercive control, that's really important to focus on, but we have to place that in the wider operations of power that people are experiencing. And this is why we've got this framework, and dimension one is actually colonial violence. Because originally when we were doing this work, the first dimension was around coercive control, the second dimension was around looking at the problematic responses from the family violence system, and the third dimension was actually looking at the forms of structural violence and oppression that were happening. But what often happens when you use a framework like that is the other two dimensions get blurred out. You know, if you're thinking about Zoom and you can blur your background, so you're still just talking about coercive control and you're not looking at those other dimensions. And if we think about victim survivors, when they're anticipating and thinking about what actions they're going to be taking, they're actually all these intersecting forms of violence are what's shaping the way that they're going to respond. And so if you know that your neighbours might ring the police and that the police might be a helpful response, you might consider running out onto the street and screaming because you're actually thinking that might be a way of raising help because I've got neighbours that are going to be responsive and I can think if the police actually turn up, they're likely to support me, not criminalise me or arrest me. And so we can't make sense of experience of intimate partner violence if we only look at that third dimension because what often happens is people's lives who are very, very affected by colonial violence and state-sanctioned violence, um, their responses might not seem intelligible if you invisibilise those first two dimensions of entrapment. Does that make sense? And so that's often, um, in the work that I've been doing, where we see um, survivors who are then prosecuted for serious crimes. And when you use those very narrow lenses to make sense of their experiences. If you just look at coercive control, um, then you're actually going to miss the wider operations of power that are happening in their lives. So this is the work of Dean Spade. He's a trans legal scholar, and he talks about trickle up or trickle down approaches. And so I think it's really important, particularly as Tangata Treaty in this country, that we think about the frameworks that we choose and whose lives get centred is often whose lives matter. And so if we use Western frameworks that centre white lives, then how are we actually going to address violence in this country? And so I think we need to be very, very careful and I really welcome this event and this 
conversations about really thinking about coercive control. So if we don't place coercive control with that wider social and systemic entrapment, then actually I think we're likely to do more harm. And that we also know when we look at what's happening in Aotearoa, that we have the over-criminalisation of Indigenous women. So 65% of women in our prisons are Māori, and we know that 68% of those women have experienced family violence. So victimisation and criminalisation are not separate issues. And I think that's my time. And so I just wanted to really think about um, yeah, how we actually are tangata treaty um, in this country and what, whose lives we're centering. So kia ora. There we go. Perfect. Um, kia ora, Rachel. That was um, amazing. I've heard Rachel speak a lot before, as I'm sure many of you have, and I am always very challenged as someone who works within the law space to kind of try and translate your very important critiques about coercive control and the way that we visualise and think about family violence into the legal space, and I think it's an ongoing challenge um, and one we all need to think about really carefully, um, especially when we're having the the debate about what we criminalise. Um, so thank you again, Rachel. Um, I'm Elizabeth MacDonald, and it's also my pleasure this evening to introduce um, Professor Heather Douglas. Um, I went back to her online accomplishments, which are enormous, <laughs> and so I thought I would just single out a few things that I, that I noticed that Heather hadn't put in her little bio for this speech. So Heather's currently a professor of law at the University of Melbourne, um, and she obviously has a long history um, working in the family violence space. Um, from my perspective, she is very much um, applauded here because she's um, been the primary author of the um, Australian Family, family Violence Bench Book. Um, and of course, if you've been keeping up with the local news in that space, that's something that you'll see made public here. I'd like to say tomorrow, but it's unlikely to be tomorrow. Um, so it's been great to see that work and actually be able to draw on some of that in the, in the domestic thinking. Um, but also, if you haven't read her award-winning book, um, Women, Intimate Partner Violence and the Law, which was published in 2021 and won... I had to go digging for this. This is how modest Heather is. Um, it won the Law and Society Association... Um, a Book of the Year Award in 2021. So we are very, very privileged to have Heather here in the country for a couple of days, and we're working her very hard, <laughs> and also very pleased that she's here uh, for this panel this evening. So welcome, Heather. Thanks, Elizabeth, and um, you know, thanks to the Clearinghouse as well. Uh, thanks to you for coming. Um, and thanks to Rachel for that fantastic setup. Uh, because actually, what I'm going to do is say that, uh, in lots of ways, New Zealand is really, through the scholars that are working on this issue very, in a very focused way here, really getting social entrapment frameworks, getting, in, getting those into consideration here in ways that I don't think we're doing very well at in Australia. Um, but having said that, just before I begin, I do want to say that um, I do all of my work on Wurundjeri land, land of the Kulin Nations in Nam, in Victoria, in Melbourne, and um, I pay my respects to the people there who um, welcome me there to do my work every day. Um, and I'm really proud to be here um, in New Zealand with you all. Um, I wanted to mention too the National Domestic and Family Violence Bench Book. Um, it is open access and I'm very excited to hear that your bench book will be open access too. I think that's really important that the materials that judges are relying on are open to the public to see so that there is a sense of open justice in those things. So that's fantastic. And another shout out is to the ARC Centre of Excellence for the Elimination of Violence, which I am also part of. I'm the de de Deputy Director of that. And Denise Wilson and um, Julia Tolmy are also partner investigators in that ambitious project to eliminate violence against women um, in seven years. Uh, I'll just keep that, you know, under my hat, but that's the aim of the centre. Um, so there is a significant debate on coercive control in Australia, 
And that debate really has centred on a criminal offence and should we have a criminal offence. We actually have recognised coercive control, as you have, in lots of other spaces in our law. So we actually have recognised coercive control in family law. It's recognised in protection order legislation. But the campaign and the focus in recent times has very much been on let's get this criminalised. Um, so this has been an intense debate in Australia and uh, with people being told to shut up and get out of the room and, and so on. So it, it, it's been an uncomfortable debate that we've been having, I have to say. And that debate has extended to the discomfort even in Senate inquiries where people have not quite come to physical blows but come to very emotionally abusive kind of uh, comments in the room. So it's been intense and highly fraught. Um, and this debate has probably been going on uh, in this way for the last three or four years. And it's all been about whether it should be a criminal offence. And there's, there's diverse views on this. There is uh, a significant research project that was brought out from Monash uh, last year, from Kate Fitzgibbon, uh, from the team at Monash University in Victoria. And they actually did a survey of 2,000 people uh, and um, obviously that's a fairly large survey and something like 85% of people, survivors, they were survivors of violence, responded that coercive control should be criminalised. That was a little part of the story. They asked other questions in the survey, such as would you use, would you want your partner to be criminalised using this offence if that offence existed? And there was much less certainty about that. Many women said they wouldn't do it, but it's good to have it there. They also were asked what they thought about the value of a coercive control offence, would it make you safer and so on. And there was also lots of uncertainty about actually what the value of it would be, what would it actually be useful for. So although there was this kind of gut reaction from respondents to the survey that yes, we want it criminalised, uh, there was much less clarity about why we would do that. What has been clear though in Australia, and Rachel's already alluded to this, is the, the position of First Nations people. Of course, nothing is ever um, unanimous, uh, but I would say that it's a majority position in Australia that First Nations people do not support the criminalisation of coercive control. Um, basically, this relates to the concerns about the over-incarceration of Aboriginal people in Australia. I think that it's true to say that we have the highest incarceration rates of Indigenous people in the world. Uh, we only have 3% of our population identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and 25 to 30% of people in custody are First Nations people. And if we actually drill down, which, which I've done with my colleague uh, uh, Robin Fitzgerald, if we drill down to Aboriginal women in custody, um, for example, for breaches of protection orders, so if we look at all the women in custody for breaches of protection orders, and true there are not so many as there are men, 60% of those women are Aboriginal women. So it, these, these criminalisation of domestic and family violence has had pretty dire effects on First Nations people. They are the ones who are more likely to be criminalised by these kinds of offences. Uh, Rachel also helpfully gave a citation, which I haven't, um, for Bellowin Jones and Akukul Anyi's work, and they've been looking at the effect of criminalisation of coercive control on women in Australia from culturally diverse and linguistically diverse backgrounds. And they find similarly um, that there are already issues with over-policing and discrimination of those communities. There are language and cultural barriers and we have to say that coercive control is an incredibly complex um, framing of domestic and family violence. So cultural and linguistic barriers for women may operate to uh, not make that particular clear what's going on for them with police and proper communication about those issues. And they say that, look, a lot of, if we do criminalise coercive control, a lot of resources go into that criminalisation. We have to train police, police have to charge it, it goes to court, there are magistrates dealing with it. That money would be much better spent on community-based solutions, which are sorely missing from those communities. So they don't support uh, criminalisation in this context either. And I think it's fair to say that culturally, linguistically diverse communities who have spoken up about this are not particularly supportive of the criminalisation of coercive control. Um, one thing that the debate has also highlighted is the definitional and operational problems with coercive control. The way that it was described by Rachel was so crystal clear, but unfortunately I think that uh, there is not a lot of connection between people's descriptions and understandings of coercive control, and we have a really long way to go with understanding uh, what it means and, and, 
and explaining to the people who will operationalise particularly any offensive coercive control. We know already that even though our family lawyers and family courts have had coercive and controlling behaviour in their legislation for some time, there is still disconnection and failure to see it uh, in many cases. So there are real questions around the definitional operational problems and can we really afford to have those in the context of criminalisation? So I think that's really important. Are we talking about the same thing? Can we be sure we're talking about the same thing? Um, the, there's been a number of very significant reports in Australia in recent years. There's been a task force uh, on women and criminal issues in Queensland, and there was also a sig ex significant Senate inquiry into the criminalisation of coercive control, specifically in uh, New South Wales. And in both those, uh, in both those uh, inquiries, there was significant community consultation uh, in relation to uh, coercive control. And one of the things that was very consistent was that there was different views about the criminalisation issue and whether there should be criminalisation. But one thing that was very consistent was, well, if you do go down that path, there needs to be significant emphasis placed on appropriate training and implementation strategies and making sure you don't get this wrong. So there's a lot of work to be done to set up for criminalisation is, is what was said in those Senate inquiries. But as I say, there was significant resistance to the idea of introducing these offences. Nevertheless, um, we have gone down the path in Australia in two states so far, New South Wales and Queensland, in criminalising coercive control. Those uh, particular offences were brought into Australia uh, and will become uh, effective in around July this year. So we have no prosecutions yet. We don't know how that will roll out. But these two offences have rolled out within a year of um, the reports being handed down, which isn't much time for community members, police officers, judges and magistrates to get their heads around how this is going to work, lawyers and so on. So there hasn't really been the level of preparation that was, was one of the recommendations from both of the reports from New South Wales and Queensland. Um, so, in summary for the New South Wales offence, um, I can say that uh, it makes an offence for an adult to engage in a course of conduct consisting of abusive behaviour against a current or former intimate partner, so it's relatively narrow. And the coercive control offence applies if the adult intends the course of conduct to coerce or control the other person. So the prosecution would have to prove that the behaviour is being done intentionally to control. That's going to be hard, I think. Um, and the coercive control offence is punishable by a maximum penalty of imprisonment of seven years. So there are some uh, qualifications on that offence. It's, it's between adults, it's, it's intimate partner relationships or former intimate partner relationships. There's ne a necessity for the proof of intention. Um, in Queensland, the offence that's been introduced is, I think, um, even more problematic than the New South Wales one. And in that particular offence, they talk about one or more incidences uh, involving a certain number of a certain kinds of behaviours. So really, it's criminal law reverting back to its old incident-based approach. So it's be interesting to see what happens with that. And there is a defence which is based on objective. Um, it's an objective defence. Objectively, was the behaviour reasonable? And the defendant might try to prove that their behaviour was reasonable. Their controlling behaviour was reasonable. So I think it's uh, really questionable how these offences will work and I guess we'll, it remains to be seen. There's really good work from Jane Wangman at um, University of Technology Sydney uh, who's questioned both of the rollout of these offences but particularly focused on New South Wales talking about the time for consultation on the actual development and definitional approach to the offences was really limited. There was almost no access to consultation from people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds and people who live in remote and rural and regional places, which obviously in New South Wales there are quite a lot of people who live in that kind of context. And particularly um, for marginalised groups and those most likely to be impacted by the proposed law, there was really little uh, opportunity for them to comment on the structure of the offence and what the offence looks like. So really concerned about the way that these two offences, but particularly so far New South Wales, has been implemented. 
Um, so watch this space, essentially, and, I, and I, I think that these things often roll out across, you know, we're, we're copying the UK and Scotland and Ireland and so on, um, and I know that criminalisation looks like an easy tool for governments to fix things with, um, and that's the road we've gone down in these two states in Australia, and I think it's, it's a, something to really watch out for. Um, I did want to mention briefly work I've done on the strangulation offence uh, in, in Australia. So I, um, this was an offence brought into Queensland in 2016 and I've spent the last three or four years really delving into the way the strangulation offence has been uh, operating as a sort of case study in looking at whether criminal law works at ending gender-based violence. And I can say um, after just almost wrapping up this particular study, and there's numbers of publications on the website which you can link to when you receive the slides, but um, we have had a lot of uh, prosecutions of this. But um, given that the coercive control offences in New South Wales and, and Queensland will be seven or 14 year sentences attached to them, you can guarantee that a lot of people will be trying to defend themselves against those charges as they have with the strangulation offence in Queensland. So a lot of people, at least to begin with, say they're going to plead not guilty, which leads to significant delay. So a lot of um, the average period of time from initial report to resolution of strangulation offence is over eight months. Uh, a lot of people do get refused bail in those cases. And then what happens usually is they are ultimately found guilty and then they're released straight back into the community. The problem with being refused bail and then being sentenced for, say, one or two months is that the person's been remanded for most of what is effectively the sentence they serve, which I suspect will be similar with these coercive control offences. There's absolutely no opportunity for interventions into the prison context because they're basically on remand. So there's been no plea of guilty, so they don't get access to services. And we've interviewed prisoners who are serving time for strangulation, and of course, prison is a hothouse for misogynistic views and bl blame shifting and creating narratives that uh, support their behaviour. So it's not a particularly good environment for learning uh, how to change behaviour without some kind of intervention. So that's been a real concern as well. No surprises also that 25% um, of the people who are charged and sentenced for strangulation are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men. Um, one of the concerning things too is that about 50% of cases of strangulation had, had children uh, present in the house when they occurred, which is probably the case uh, likely for coercive control. And there's nothing done about those children. In fact, what often happens is if they're of a certain age, if they're sort of over the age of 10, they are called in to give evidence in these particular cases. So it's incredibly traumatic for them. So the case study on that is not particularly uh, inspiring for the role of criminal law in responding to gender-based violence. So what might work? So something that we've introduced in Australia just last year is the National Principles on Coercive Control. I give you a one-page version here from their website, um, but this is a sort of 60-page document that's had a lot of consultation over the last couple of years. And I think this is a kind of much more helpful approach because what it is doing is setting out literally principles. So this is a set of principles that is supposed to guide our responses across our sector and across our country. So this, these principles should be suitable for the health sector, the legal sector, the social support sector, etc., etc. So this idea of bringing people along with a shared understanding of coercive control, which not doesn't necessarily have much to do with criminalisation. And in fact, that last um, principle of embedding the national principles in legal responses to coercive control, initially it just talked about criminal law and state responses, but with some lobbying and pushing, we've, in, we've been able to expand that into all of our systems, so migration, social security, all of these systems should be thinking about how we understand coercive control. So just to finish, what should be we work on? And this is just me talking about Australia and my, my view of Australia, and I wouldn't think to suggest this of you, but um, I think we should reduce our reliance on criminal law. It's too easy a to go-to and it doesn't seem to work. And if it is utilised, we really need to think about how we do it, and we really need to think about what we're doing for sentencing, because we don't, it's not safe, uh, it makes it worse at the moment and we need to be thinking about what we're doing there. We also need consistency and maybe the principles help here, but we need consistency in our definition and understanding and that needs to be across systems 
And of course, what we've been calling for everywhere where we work on family violence is joining up systems, sharing information, making things safe, um, making courts a one-stop rather than 20, proper health support, proper legal support, proper social support. So we need to join up those systems and we're far from there. Thank you. Um, maybe we'll go and hold on a bit in these various spaces, because I have to say, when I read um, your uh, response to the proposal, I was gobsmacked that it went ahead anyway. So it's a, it's a bit of a shame, isn't it, that we're doing all this, you know, people like you are doing all this good work, but actually governments aren't responding to it effectively and appropriately. Um, very, but I think probably very useful to be aware of those principles. I mean, that might be a way forward for some of the work that we're doing in the, in the, in the legal space. Um, so thank you. Thank you for coming for your amazing address. Um, aren't we blessed tonight? And we're about to be blessed by someone else um, shortly. Um, and that is um, the wonderful um, Denise Wilson, who's um, Professor of Māori Health in AUT. She's also a Fellow of the Royal Society. Um, and again, I just want to highlight um, a couple of pieces of work that I've found really helpful in my thinking. Um, one of them is the um, work that came out of a Marsden grant, um, Etu Wahine Etu Fano. And if you haven't read that on Māori women's safety, it's, it's really been quite important, well, very important and very helpful. Um, and I noticed because the Family Violence Clearinghouse is always on the money, yesterday Denise's next book was in the media, um, and here she is tonight, and that's her work, um, which I've yet to look at, um, a, little, a, lit a litany, let me get my glasses on for this one, of Sound Revisited, which was published last year, I think. So again, we're incredibly privileged to hear now as the last speaker of this evening, um, Professor Denise Wilson. Ina mana, ina rego, ina hui fa, roranga tira ma, <clears throat> tina koto, tina koto, tina koto katoa, na mihi mahana kia koto itina wa. Ko wai au he uria hau, tainui nati paro ki heratonga, fakatoa he nati oni oni me, nati tu fari toa kordani swasa na hau. So within the context of Wahini Māori being at, at more risk of severity of harm and homicide from intimate partner violence compared to other women in Aotearoa, we set out to find, understand how Māori women keep safe in unsafe relationships. We found Ma Wahini Māori were resourceful, resilient, and all strived hard to keep them and their children safe. They used silence, compliance, and isolation as safety strategies, and Whakapapa informed their decisions about their tamariki, often to their detriment. We also found that when they'd exhausted their strategies to keep them and their, their tamariki safe and navigated their partner's coercive control, they encountered what we called systemic entrapment. So I'm going to read you a few examples of, of this, and I could give you numerous different examples. So a lack of care and protection. One woman said, there is no protection for a woman, so what happens? The woman tries to protect the children, staying in a relationship that she doesn't want to be in generally. Then some agency finds out, and they want to protect the children. So they remove the children, but they do nothing to help the woman. <clears throat> this woman um, was born into a life of violence and had her life shaped by it. She said, why didn't I ask for help? I was unable to seek help. I was embarrassed, ashamed, confused, and didn't trust strangers. Not helped by having black eyes and being under the influence of meth. The mere thought of going to organisations for help engendered a sense of dread and hatred. I knew I wouldn't be welcome 
and the people in them were always quick to judge me. Besides, they've taken my kids away. The simple truth is, I didn't feel vulnerable getting the bash or being scared. I felt totally vulnerable having to go to organisations and ask for help. I no longer had a choice if I wanted to be in my child's life. Another woman up against the system said, I have a protection order for my tamariki's safety. He's not allowed to be around, but by some means he always manages to. He took the phone the social worker gave me. He was released on monitoring at relatives down the road. So he started sneaking out, sneaking to our house. I was happy when he was in jail. I didn't have to worry. Now I only have half my freedom because he's still here. He physically and sexually abuses his tamariki's mother in front of them. No one in the agencies will help him, help keep him away from us. They say I agreed to him to live down the road. I had no choice to agree because I knew from the look on his face and how he held his body that if I didn't agree when the judge asked, we would suffer more, even more. These are just a few examples. So what we found was that Māori women um, simultaneously navigate between being safe and unsafe. And given our time constraints tonight, because I could talk a very long <laughs> on this, um, I want to focus on being unsafe. But what I want to emphasise first is the strengths that the wahine in our research had to navigate the nexus of being safe and unsafe. All of these women often have non-Māori partners, so I just also want to make that note because it's often assumed they're Māori partners. Our current research also shows that wahine Māori are oftentimes a whānau of one. Isolated from their whānau, friends and other support systems they rely on, um, they have to rely on agencies and family violence services for their support. For wahine Māori, being unsafe is more than managing a partner's violence and coercive control. We live in a society that still stigmatises victim survivors of family violence in general, but for wahine Māori, they have the added challenges of interpersonal and systemic racism and discrimination. When, we need, when they need to seek help and support, it's government agencies and family violence services they rely on. But with little trust and heightened fear for their and their tamariki safety in life, they generally encounter unhelpful people. We found often wahine Māori did not get the help they needed, were denied entitlements from government agencies and were subject to discrimination at, on multiple levels. So that got us to thinking that we need to um, start communicating new understandings of entrapment. And I should have brought my box, but I forgot. <laughs> um, so if you can imagine that this has got two boxes and um, the first box represents um, a partner's coercive control, and if you take off the lid, the sides fall apart. So each of the sides has a dimension of that the way in which that coercive control happens, and inside is the box. So if, if women navigate the, their partner to, to ask for help, they then encounter a systemic um, response that's oftentimes not helpful. And the um, design student, Briar um, Dowling, who um, worked with me on this, she um, created um, the kitty to represent women inside and, um, and with lots of potential. So systemic treatment um, we've sort of defined um, is, is around um, probably four key things. Um, the first is the fear that their tamariki will be removed. And this is a fear that's based in reality. 
In 2019, I was involved in, um, in a study that was a birth cohort of all children in Aotearoa born in 1998 through to the age of 18. And one in four of all children living in, in Aotearoa at that time were, would, were reported to Child Protection Services at some stage in their first 17 years of their life. For Māori children, that was one in two. Um, and there's no explanation of why that's such a, an increased amount. We also know that um, Tamariki Māori make up 57% and Māori and Pacific Tamariki make up 11% of children in state care. So this is a fear very much grounded in reality for Māori women. They know that if they have to put their hands up with help, for help, this is a reality. And I just want to say that the ones that you know, we've been involved in, and that's quite a number, um, are in the fight of their life, trying to get those children back once they're taken. The next part of this is the fear that they will be treated dis dis uh, judgmentally, disrespectfully, and in racist ways. They're often um, accused of being mad, bad, and angry, so that's been some of the feedback that I've got when we've been um, presenting this. That's made me go away and look at our data again. But I would actually argue that these women are expecting to be treated badly, and so what they do is put up the barriers and they're on the offensive. The difference that somebody who's kind and caring and has the, gives them some time to listen helps bro reduce those barriers. Um, encountering unhelpful people. I don't know how many times I've listened to the comment, you think that they were paying it out of your own pocket. Um, so time and time again, we've heard that. And so it really highlights the fact that, you know, when you have got nothing, and one woman said, she started her interview with, they just don't get it. They just don't get that if I walk out, I've got no roof over our heads, we've got no money for Kai, and, and on she went about these things. And ironically, she said, but if I stay, they'll, be, they'll have, be, have a roof, they'll be warm, they'll be feared, um, and I can keep them safe. So, you know, that just goes to show, um, you know, uh, the anomalies that exist for um, these women. Um, the other is fragmented and ineffective services that don't meet their needs. So they cannot be guaranteed, for example, um, that when they do so summon up the courage to leave um, they're going to get the help that they ask for. They can't guarantee that police are going to respond to 111 calls and that they will get the necessary guidance to secure a benefit. Um, and so an example of this is a, a young woman who walked out with her four children um, in the middle of winter when it was wet and freezing cold with just what they had on them. It took her weeks to get a benefit and weeks later before she got an appointment around her housing, only to be told when she turned up that it was her decision to leave and her, her application was not going to be um, reviewed. So I think, you know, in terms of disrupting systemic entrapment and support, supporting um, Wahine Māori better, is around starting to think about the way in which we think about this. So understanding that whakapapa is central, even for those wahine who aren't necessarily being brought up in, you know, with a culturally rich environment, we found that that still is important, as, as is the collective obligations and responsibilities they have to others. Taking the time to listen, Understanding that it takes them a lot of courage to leave and to ask for help. Um, and realising that attitudes of kindness, understanding their situation and genuinely helping 
um, makes a difference. The woman who this made a difference to um, had different outcomes. Um, also, there are experiences of intergenerational um, violence are not always restricted to their own whānau. So we found that they were dealing with the intergenerational violence of, of their partners. So um, not all, all the women that have been in our study um, had a history of violence in their whānau. Um, and um, understanding family dynamics and you know, its dynamics, its coercive control and the many faces of entrapment. Um, I think you know, the, the, the whole issue around um, social entrapment and that understanding within a colonised view is um, a really important factor that we need to think about in this. Um, so, no reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, thank you so much, um, Denise. Um, I think that was um, a very powerful um, presentation that... Um, it's sort of, I'm so pleased that we got to hear um, that you're able to share the voices of the woman, the Māori woman that you worked with, because it kind of grounds us back in the reality of the um, issues that we're talking about. Um, so thank you very much, Denise, for your research, um, continuing to um, shine a light on those women's experiences. Um, we'd now like to invite um, all of the speakers um, to sit. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know, are they well positioned for people to see? Um, we might need to jiggle them around a bit. And also I'd like to um, welcome into the room and introduce um, Professor Julia Tolmey, who's a Professor of Criminal Law at um, the University of Auckland and also a Fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand, Te Aparangi. Um, and Julia has also um, is, done a lot of research in this area. Um, you'll have seen her name on some of the references. Um, <laughs> that were up on the slide, um, and was also um, has also been the chair um, of the New Zealand Family Violence Death Review Committee. Um, so welcome, Julia, um, and all our speakers. We haven't, as as we know, we haven't got a huge amount of time. We've got about fifteen minutes um, for questions, um, and because of that, if people could just keep them reasonably brief, that would be really great. Um, so open it to the floor. Um, we've got Charlotte and Caleb with mic roving microphones. So. Um, oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, for Denise, um, could you be uh, like give an example or be specific about what it means to understand whakapapa? When it, when it comes to supporting Māori women? I, I guess not knowing um, whakapapa, but understanding that whakapapa is important for Māori and its connectedness. So what we found is that Māori women oftentimes made decisions about um, their children. And for example, um, one of the women who... Um, was in a, in a parenting program, residential one. Um, her partner got out of prison, was in another town, um, rang up and said, I want our baby to meet her grandmother. So she bussed to the other town um, and handed baby over and left them for a couple of hours. And somebody dobbed them in and um, yeah, they swooped in and took, removed her child from her care for life. And her, her comment to that was, I was trying to look after her whakapapa. It's really important that she knows who she is and where she comes from. And nobody told me the rules. So she didn't understand that she couldn't do that. So I guess that's an example of whakapapa. 
that knowing that these women may make decisions that then become detrimental. Hello? Oh. <laughs> um, I don't quite know how to keep this brief. I um, am really interested in the whole um, concept and practice of it. As first as a, a woman that had to escape a violent relationship um, and as a woman brought up in violence as a child and then as a disabled woman and um, the, the whole disability industry and the coercion and control that goes on. But the more I explore it, I've come to this place where, where I, feel, I feel ashamed of not, not carrying shame of what was done to me, but what I realise that I've done to my own children. And... And so I, I really want your take on this because it seems to me that, that the discrimination of children, the adultism that they grow up in within systemic discrimination, that, that I have been coerced as a parent into coercing my own children. So I, I, I want to hear from you about that. I suppose um, we were talking today, I was talking to judges about um, use of children by an abusive partner uh, in the con in, within coercive controlling behaviours as a tactic. So keeping a, a woman within, a co I, I'm not sure about your situation so I won't comment directly on that obviously, but, but Keeping a woman from leaving because she's fearful of losing her children is, is a tactic of coercive control. Um, making threats about what he will do to the children or that he will keep the children if she ever tries to leave or, um, you know, manipulating family court processes about the care of the mother in those processes. Uh, children are used as part of the tools of coercive control in many cases. Um, I, I would really, I, I can see the systemic approaches here, which Rachel and um, Denise might talk to or Julia might talk to more. Um, but certainly courts can become part of that system which uh, coerce, uses coercive, allows coercive control to continue in that way by, you know, sharing care of children or, you know, not giving women safe spaces to escape to and so on. So, uh, you know, I... I, I, I want to say to you that you probably weren't part of that, that you, it was probably part of a controlling set of circumstances, but, you know, I'll leave kind of commenting on your specific situation to yourself to just leave it at those points. But if you wanted to add. I can't. Yes, you can. I can't really add much other than to say that there's a lot of work done on you know, the whole family is systemically in a situation where they've been abused and the Family Violence Death Review Committee talked about um, uh, child abuse and abuse of women as being entangled because they are often the same thing. Um, I can't speak to the guilt and shame that every parent feels having survived a situation and looking back and wishing you could have done differently. I think it's a much more personal journey. Um, thank you so much for talking about the coercive control and the, 
things that could be a drawback and negative or not. I'm just wondering, in terms of the UK, what are we learning about from the UK's use of the law that might help us get it a bit differently? I think there's some really interesting things coming out of the UK. One is it's not the law change, it's all the shifts around that really matter. So there, there haven't been massive changes in the UK. Um, so there is some work um, that has shown that the same cases are coded as coercive control or physical violence in the UK, but the police don't rush to the cases in, that have been coded as physical violence, oh, sorry, as coercive control. They take a lot longer, they have a way, because it's a complex response and they don't see it as being urgent, but they're actually the same cases. Because we, what we know from the work is that um, physical violence is one of the many tactics of coercive control. Um, I think the other thing that's really interesting is once we start criminalising coercive control, I just went to the European conference on family violence and I was really concerned that what we're doing is actually, because we don't really understand coercive control, it's a complex concept to understand and apply, we're really inviting the state into our private lives to police interpersonal relationships. And things that are really just bad behaviour being labelled as coercive control when they're just bad behaviour and asking the state to come in and determine whether that's a criminal offence or not, I think it's really a grave concern. And I think some of the things that have happened in the UK is because when they've criminalised, they've focused on the psychological abuse, so the understanding of coercive control has moved very far away from even starts conceptualisation. Uh, so we need to really think about what does criminalisation actually achieve and how a lot of these concepts taken from one context and transposed into another lose their transformational elements and often get... Uh, replicate the old and outdated understandings that we're actually trying to get rid of, like battered woman syndrome. So this whole conflation over there of coercive control is psychological abuse. Psychological abuse often people see hasn't had the same attention, but I think you need to be really, really careful when we also start to separate different forms of abuse, because once we invisibilise physical violence and sexualised violence, then we start down that slippery slope of invisibilising violence by the state and the, the wider context. So these are quite complex ideas, and I think people really need to engage with some of the readings and engage with some of the debates that are happening. But we do know in Aotearoa that we're very, very good at adopting Western um, theories of violence and behaviour and you know, just plonking them down like all the prevention science and things like that in Aotearoa. So I think with caution, proceed with caution, and we need to be listening um, to the wonderful work of people like Denise and her colleagues and look at what's happening in our country around carceralism, look what's coming out of the Royal Commission and really think about which direction do we want to take. Uh, kia ora koutou. Well, having heard that none of you really seem to support the notion of criminalisation of coercive control, my question is, do you think it is a useful tool for integrating into the legal response to domestic violence in any other way? Um, I mean, I, I do, and I think I pointed to that in the Australian context. I think it's really useful to have an understanding of coercive control when you're looking at migration, when you're looking at family law, when you're looking at whether people need protection. Um, I think there are lots of legal areas which could benefit from um, incorporation or an understanding of coercive control, yes. But I don't know that that necessarily leads to um, co a coercive control offence. I think in the context of defending a woman, which is kind of really my area in the criminal justice, I think coercive control is just a tiny part of the picture, of course. I think it's systemic and social entrapment. But I don't see lawyers really doing the work around it. So um, when you're trying to understand uh, and respond to a woman who's offended in the context of 
violence, you really want to understand the circumstances. And both coercive control and entrapment require a detailed understanding of what you went through. Because when you understand that, her responses often look very reasonable. But we don't do that work. We just go, oh, she was subject to abuse and she developed a mental health issue. Um, so understanding that's a real paradigm shift and doing the forensic work required to really appreciate a person's circumstances, I think, would be really helpful in the criminal justice context. And I would actually add in there that you take a life course approach to that because sometimes um, patterns of behaviour are set up quite early in life. Um, and I'm, I'm just thinking of when, when you are young, at like age eight, 12, and you're responsible for looking after your siblings, and you look after everybody else, and, and that sets up that pattern as you go through life. And um, so you put yourself to the, to the back of the picture and to the background. Um, so sometimes working out what you need is not on top of things. So I think, you know, ha having a life course approach to understanding the context and the situation within which um, events happen now in later life is really critical. And I think the points that I was trying to make is that people don't live individual lives and they don't experience individual forms of violence. So we need to contextualise coercive control in the bigger framework of social and systemic entrapment. And we're, that's why we have inverted it and actually look at that infrastructure of violence um, as that first level of entrapment. Because we know that if you try to take a coercive control approach, <laughs> clip on a bit of intersectionality, clip on things never stay clipped on. It's like cultural competency approaches. They just clip them onto white frameworks. And so I think you need to take that big picture and then, as you're saying, make that detailed analysis um, as you go through those different intersecting forms of power. Because we know that it doesn't work the other way. And we know whose lives get centred when we use white Western frameworks and whose lives um, are invisibilised and their responses invisibilised. And so I think we need to be really, really careful. We don't go for quick wins, nice, easy, simple ways of making sense of what are very complex layers and layers of violence. Hi. When I, I heard about the... Um, the seminar tonight, I thought I was coming along to a world um, coercive behaviour and systematic entrapment. And I only learnt when I came that it was from the Family Violence Clearinghouse, which I thought was really interesting because I think our whole world is in a social um, coercive behaviour and social systematic entrapment. We are in a really bad space in the world. I've been on this planet for a number of years Family violence I've been involved with for over 50 years in the disability sector, working with people with learning and intellectual disabilities. And we've not moved one cent, we've gone back. So a statement more than um, opening up dialogue. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. I think we've just got one Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so um, as a Tory, I'm researching on cursive control, so I'm kind of struggling with systemic entrapment in terms of whether that only applies to wahine and Māori or whether that applies to others. I'm, I'm going to say no. Um, I think it applies to all women. Um, but, but I think... It, here in Aotearoa, it's really notable that wahine Māori are greatly disadvantaged. But I would also then say, um, for example, poor people, immigrant women, who are, who are attached to their husband's visa, who have little options to walk out that door, because if they do, they no longer have a status to stay in this country. So I think, you know, it's, it's really complex and, um, you know, I mean, I can t I talk about the, the woman that I research with um, and have done for some time. 
Um, but I am, I'm also aware, I mean, when we are on the Deaf Review Committee, we saw other women who um, were entrapped by the system as well. I think probably most of the victims that we were looking at experienced social and systemic entrapment because our family violence safety system is not designed for family violence, it's a default system. Um, so unless women are very privileged and have other ways of handling it, it's an experience for all women. The point of developing an entrapment framework is though to put all women front and centre stage, to have a framework that works for everyone, not just the most privileged women. Kia ora koutou. I think we're going to wrap up our Q&A there. Um, I just really want to again say a huge thank you to all of our panellists this evening. Um, Heather, uh, Rachel, Denise and Dulia joining us um, at the end. We really appreciate your time and insights um, this evening. It's been fantastic. We have a little koha for each of you um, and also for our wonderful um, facilitator Elizabeth. Um, I'm just going to close. There was one slide that Fire Denise um, didn't quite get to that I think is really nice to finish on. So I'm just going to pop that there for some final reflection. Um, and I will close our you tonight uh, with a karakia. Um, I hope that you all go um, well into your evenings and the week. Um, it's only Monday. Um, gosh, the year already feels like it's uh, heading um, at full steam. So, um, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, me karakia tātou. Ka whakari ata tapu, kia wātea ai te ara, kia tūriki whakataha ai, kia tūriki whakataha ai. Hau mea hui e tai ki e. So go well one and all and thank you once again for joining us this evening. We will be putting the slides up on our website and also the recording from this evening. Um, so please do have a look. Um, if you've got questions about any of the references, you can also um, contact us at the NZFBC um, if you've got any curiosity um, or would like more research on this area as well. So um, wonderful. Thank you all.